building in a world that is governed by the International Builders Code and that includes the permitting process and engineering and plan inspection means that when you're doing these things, you have to comply with the drawings that have been approved by the jurisdiction that has oversight for what you're doing. There are life safety issues, there are policy issues, there are uh, code requirements that exist for really questionable reasons and code requirements that exist for darn good reasons. But at this point, I'm setting up a footing that has to comply with the drawings that my engineer provided because the county is going to approve those drawings and then the inspector is going to evaluate the site conditions against what the, the, the approved plans say. So the approved plans say that this footing needs to be 48 inches wide. And it is, except in a couple spots. Like right here, it's 46 inches wide. Right here, it's 45 inches wide. So we're going to go back along this corner and we're going to break off some of the where the rock intrudes into the net width. Number three bar is three eighths. Number five bar is five eighths. Number 10 bar, eight, 10, is an inch and a quarter. Okay, so that, if, if you need number six bar, it's three quarters of an inch. The mat on the bottom of this footing is number four bar with three longitudinal continuous bars and the transverse bars at 90 degrees happen at 18 inches on center. Development length is the distance that rebar has to lap in order for the strength of the concrete at the lap to be such that it will hold those bars together as if it were a single bar. Now I'm counting on some of you engineers in the comments to give me a more concise description of development length, but from the perspective of a carpenter, the development length is the lap on rebar where you can tie it together so that it functions as a single bar. The typical bar overlap that is used kind of as a th uh, rule of thumb in construction is 40 bar diameters. I'm giving these about 46 bar diameters, or 23, 24 inches, just a little extra. The transverse bars are specified at 18 inches on center. So I'm gonna mark my longitudinal bars every foot and a half. One foot six, three feet. We're going to use a we're going to use two different methods of tying this re, um, tying this rebar together, and they both involve tie wire. And the first is using a wire reel. Now this is this is the tool that you'll see pros using, particularly iron workers. And guys get to where they're so fast with these things. If you don't have one of these, <laughs> it's really hard. So you start it through there, and you tighten it up. You really only need a glove on your left hand if you're a right-handed rod buster because this is the one that's going to get all greasy from the wire. With this bar in the right spot, you hold it back so you have three inches clear, you put it on the layout, you pull it tight, you give it a wrap, you give it a wrap, you cut it, you twist it. That's tied. That's just a simple overhand tie. Now we're going to show you the other way that we're going to use, that Nate's going to use. Slide it under there, grab the end, grab the other end, tight. One of the things that the engineer has specified and that the inspector will be looking for is the distance from the rebar to the dirt and the distance from the rebar to the face of the concrete. 
That's because in order for the rebar to contribute its full, contribute its full strength to the structure, it has to be fully encased in enough concrete so that the full compressive strength of the material is um, contributing to the stability of the overall system. The other reason is, is because you don't want this rebar rusting inside of your concrete, so you keep it back from any place that water might tend to wick up from the moisture or come back in from cracks and rust the rebar inside the concrete. So clearance. I'm going to accomplish clearance from the soil with these. These are called wired dobies. Little blocks of concrete with wire already on them. We put that underneath the mat, tie it to hold it in place. It holds the, the rebar up three inches from the soil. That's what the engineer specified. We will have dobies of other sizes in other applications, but in this footing is a three inch clearance. We're going to use lots of three inch wired dobies. So these footings are withstanding at least two primary forces. They're withstanding the weight of the wall and the soil that's pushing down on them. And equally important, they're resisting the overturning moment, the tendency for the hillside lot to tip the wall over. So they're cantilevered, they're wide, and they have two mats of rebar. They have one down in the bottom, which is on the compression side of the footing, that is the side that is just resisting the tendency to be pushed down into the subgrade, and they have one up in the top part of the footing that's helping resist the overturning moment of the wall so that it doesn't just tear out the top of the concrete and go away. The challenge is supporting that top mat because you can't just drive stakes down into the subgrade and wire the mat to that because even if it's a piece of rebar, a stake that you've driven in there temporarily, rust will climb up from where it's embedded in the soil and it'll rust that vertical piece and then the rust will crawl out into your mat and it'll, it'll degrade your footing from the inside out. So you have to arrange some sort of a method to suspend that, hold it in place while you pour it. You can have stirrups bent. Any sort of a rebar fabrication facility can bend stirrups in fancy shapes. So you can set them on top of the bottom mat and wire them to it and they'll hold up a point on your top mat and away you go. But something that I have just sort of, it just occurred to me as I was wrestling with, man, I don't have time to get those stirrups bent because it's Labor Day weekend and uh, Nate's going to be here Monday and we got to make this happen. And so I thought, hey, let's just get a hog panel. Now hog panels are a type of fencing. They're galvanized, they're number nine wire, they are spot welded at the junctures. They're pretty good, they're stiff. And so we cut rips the right width to space the bottom and top mat. And I'm bending these things about a foot from the end. Look at that. I'll just wire that to the bottom mat and it'll just create a nice little table to lay the top mat on, hold it up, will never degrade. It does not put enough steel in there to create any kind of a weakened plane joint. The, the footing won't even know that there's that additional wire in there, but it'll hold the top mat in a plane up away from the soil, clearance from the face, awesome. I'm gonna write that down in my little book as uh, one for the good guys. This 2x4 is a template for supporting these verts. The bottom of this template is at the grade of the top of the concrete. I hold it with my chin. I figure eight. You see that? Twist it up. 